Section 5 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives. Darky, a New Zealand dog. An old bullock stood innocently grazing near a clump of bushes. His eyes were brown wells of candor, but his ways were full of guile. Near to him, and hidden under the clump of bushes, lay a man and a black dog. No other bred, the latter, just a New Zealand mongrel, homely and rough but with a keen intelligence and a will to serve his master man bullock and dog all were watching a herd of cattle that was grazing out on the plain one wing slowly swinging toward the watchers in a short time the three would be at work and each knew his part one more dark lady jemmy be ready one more and we'll call it a mob with eleven already if we get away with it and we always have it will be a good haul jemmy the old bullock looked at the man and at a gesture known to him began to move slowly toward the nearing herd a stock rider went suddenly by them but jemmy looked like and but for the absence of a brand might have been one of the herd and the man and the dog were well under cover. The stock rider rode on and was soon lost in the dust ahead. Now, Jemmy, in at them. Darky, to your work. Darky leaped across the open. Jemmy singled out a fat steer and began to edge it away from the herd, the dog nipping at his heels. The man under the bushes chuckled they're a great pair they play the hands and i take the trick slowly and skillfully the steer was separated from its fellows now it disappeared behind a clump of bushes in company with its new-found friend jemmy the bullock though rather confused and bewildered by the manoeuvres of darky as they passed from sight, the man rolled himself under the bushes and came out on the side away from the unconscious herd, all quiet out there, and the theft of a steer had not been noticed by a soul. It was an old trick, this. The herders called it cattle lifting. The man, we will call him Steed, was known by name to every herder in the south island of new zealand and vainly had he been hunted and tracked he rode no horse and had ways of disappearing just when his pursuers were sure of him the old bullock always looked mild and innocent and darky well where his master could hide he could very carefully had steed trained his quaint partners in crime who worked simply for their master not knowing they were thieves and cunning indeed was the whole plan all that was known was that here there and anywhere a fine beast might disappear always from a point unwatched by the herders so today as on many other days, the dog and bullock did their master's nefarious hiding. Sheltered by bushes and rocks, they drove the steer along a complete and selected cover, which had served their purpose many a time. Down through a dry water course they went, and no one the wiser. No great need for caution here. There was no grass to tempt the herds, no trail to follow. The rolling pebbles 
left no sign of passing, and the men following behind covered all possible tracks. Now the banks grew steeper, and great rocks overhung the sides with a most comforting shade, for it was midday and the sun was hot. Suddenly around the bend, in the tiny canon, appeared a trickle of water, then green grass, and now there opened out the most delightful of tiny meadows, walled in by the rocks, and here and there, grazing contentedly ankle-deep in the infant stream, stood eleven fat cattle, the latest comer completing the round dozen. Now then, there will be no halting for lunch. Get your drinks, Jemmy and Darky. That's all. We've got to be out of here. And on the quive vive, Montrose got wind of us, and every last one of this bunch is branded deep enough to hang me. So it's Southland for us, and an all night trip. Darky, herd them out. On down the watercourse, went the little herd until the rock walls dwindled and were lost in a rolling down and a wide plain stretched out before them steed gave a swift look around the horizon nothing stirred in all that great sweep of country they must cross the open and reach the woodland on the other side before they could feel safe from pursuit Pity it could not have been done after nightfall. But there was no time to be lost. We must reach the butchers in Southland, some of whom did not hesitate to buy branded cattle. Branded hide could easily be destroyed, and after that, what evidence could be found? Across the plain trailed the little mob of cattle, not another living thing in sight a half hour more one river to cross and down in the green shadows on the other side was a strat getaway to southland and the buyers waiting at the river bank jamie's wisdom came once more into play there was a bridge farther down but it would not be safe to cross a bridge the current was deep and swift but Jemmy was strong, and at the word he plunged in. Steed, who could not swim, held tightly to his tail, and thus won to the further side. Darky remained with the cattle. Old Jemmy floundered up the bank and began to blow melodiously and invitingly as if he had reached a land of clover and rice grass darky prodded the heels of the stolen herd one by one they accepted jemmy's invitation and soon the whole twelve were whirling along down and across the indefatigable darky always behind now it remained only for them to strike the old trail in and out among the bushes went the cattle dipping their muscles into the rich grass and now they disappeared into the undergrowth of the forest then into the twilight of the stately kauri pines safe at last halt steed's hand went to his hip pocket no use we've got you covered you're caught this time and with the goods three six eight grinding heads appeared from behind a fallen log montross stepped forward and quizzically eyed the procession that's a great little mass of brands you're driving mertons comstocks quarrens fearings god there's one of mine too well we'll take em in charge they needn't trouble you any more where do you get the old bullock he isn't branded 
Steed did not answer for a moment. The end had come for him. He had no doubt of that. After all these years of successful cattle lifting, the one time too many had arrived. Well, he was game. The bollocks mine, his old Jemmy, and this here's Darky. Now you know the firm. They've done the business, and that's why you never caught on to the way I work it. Ho, ho! I see. Well, it was a great game. You had us guessing. There won't be much guessing for you, though. We've got a little court all waiting for you at Southland. Judge, jury, and clerk. We'll try all three of you. Get your horses, fellows, and we'll start. And they were tried all three. Short shrift they made of steed. Twelve branded cattle were evidence enough. The jury found him guilty, and the judge sentenced him to prison for a long term. Exit steed. Poor old Jemmy. When it came his turn, he did not understand. The court, however, thought it a great joke. He was tried and convicted on circumstantial evidence, without a word to say for himself, and sentenced to be shot. One crack of a rifle, and it was all over for Jemmy. As for Darky, he too was tried, convicted, and condemned to death. Somehow, no one had the heart to carry out the sentence on the spot. He had been a thief, but he had only done his master's bidding, according to his training. Although the jury was against him, his plucky eye gained for him many a friend in the audience. Particularly, there was one who had seen that passage across the river with the herd. Darky was given a reprieve of one night. Next morning, in Darky's prison cell, was found an old, decrepit black dog. No questions were asked. The dog was killed according to the sentence. Thus Darky died by proxy, and the law had no further hold on him. Neither were any questions asked when a young herder sold a black dog to Belcher, one of the rich sheep herders of the country. Darky himself was the only questioner. It is all very well for a man to buy a dog who has already been trained to a certain kind of service. But Darky had a mind of his own in the matter. He had loved his old master, and they had taken him away. Very well, he was not prepared to serve any master who came along and paid money for him. He had the right of an educated dog to choose. Work for Belcher, he would not. Belcher was not a good man, nor a gentle. He shouted and swore at Darky, and he whipped him. Then, in a fit of anger, he seized his gun. But as he trained his eye along the stock and cocked the trigger, there was no Darky to aim at. He had no intention of standing to be shot like old Jemmy, not he. Now, Hori, Belcher's Maori shepherd, big, black, and good-natured, asked if he might take the dog. Belcher swore again. Oh, take the cur if you like. He's no good to me, nor to anybody. I'll save my cartridge for something worthwhile. Hori whistled to Darky, who was skulking behind a group of sheep herders. Every man at the Rugged Hills sheep station was watching, and more than one would have liked to take the black dog for his own, should Hori fail. There was a moment of silence. Darky took a good canny look at Hori, 
The man was of his own color, and his eyes were friendly. Darky concluded to trust him and came forward. Horry said a few words in a soft voice, patted the dog's head, and when Horry struck out for his hut, Darky dropped to heel and followed him, as if the question of master was settled. Horry's hut was on Weka Flat, many miles from the rugged hills station, but Darky traveled untiringly. On the way, Horry from his seat on Mulhalle Brothers, his horse, talked to the dog, and although the Maori language was unknown to Darky, somehow an understanding grew up between the black man and the black dog and from the time when horry sat down on the door sill of his little hut and took the quivering muzzle between his two hands there was never any question who was darky's master weka flat was a dull country and the life was dull the flat itself was a small tract of grass country surrounded by hills that were clothed monotonously in bunches of yellow tussock. No one ever came that way. It was an outlying district on Belcher's property, and not even another shepherd had occasion to pass through it. Horry lived quite alone, with the flock he tended and two of Belcher's sheep-dogs. Darky did not find it dull, however. He was much too busy from the first. His old training stood him in good stead. He was accustomed to obey a gesture, and Horace soon taught him by signs to obey him. Belcher's shouted orders had simply confused him. The first time Horace sent him into the flock, Darky singled out a fat, fine-conditioned sheep and brought him proudly to his new master. But he soon learned that the whole flock was his, and felt his importance accordingly. He liked driving the big herd, and it was not long before Horry could send him alone miles away to gather the sheep. He would return, wagging his tail triumphantly, and without one missing his old master had never had more than a few cattle or sheep at a time, and these were constantly changing. It was good to be driving the same flock day after day, until one knew every old year and weather by sight. Several months went by, and Darky was a happy, contented dog. There came a day when there was a grand muster, and Horry and Darky started down the country with a mob of five hundred fat weathers. Darky was in ecstasies of excitement. He ran hither and thither as if he were joint owner with Horry. It was three days' journey and the first night found them camped near a river bottom with little hills rising all about them, bare and ghostly. The flock, for some reason, seemed uneasy, and Darky had trouble quieting them down for the night. As Hardy and Darky were finishing their evening meal, a drop of rain fell on Hardy's forehead. Hardy Look it around. The daylight had long since faded, but even in the dark one could see a much darker mass rolling up from the west. Hori shrugged his shoulders, made his camp under an overhanging rock where the rain could not reach him, and fell dead asleep. His horse grazed quietly near him, and it was Darky's watch. The drops came thicker and faster, and now fell a torrent of rain. 
such a flood had not been known in that region for years hour after hour it poured down rivulets began to flow in the little water courses down the hills everywhere toward the dry river bed and now it was no longer dry the little streams gathered their forces and made a big stream a roaring tumbling mass that swelled and grew rolling down the valley a black dog thrust his nose into horry's face and was gone again horry half awakened threw out his arm and his hand touched a rim of water he sprang up and looked around a gray glimmer of dawn showed him the rising river at his very feet it was no longer even a river it was a flood of muddy tossing foam out of which rose the little hills like islands the dwellers in that land still talk of the wall of water that rose suddenly and swept away houses and people devastating whole tracts of country there was no time to be lost if hori would save himself the sheep he could see nowhere in the dim light and darky too had disappeared lost all of them no doubt there was no chance for them in this mad sweeping chaos of water Horry's horse stood near him whining with fear there was a way out along a rocky ledge just a bare chance now half in the water now stumbling over slippery rocks now leaping from islet to islet gradually Horry and Mulhale brothers worked to higher ground half drowned and with the horse gasping for breath hori saw on a hilltop safe above the flood a homestead at its very door stone mohale brothers fell exhausted saved but the flock and darky poor darky where were they lost for a certainty hori's heart sunk as he thought of belcher and his certain anger and of his black four-footed friend darky had wakened him or he too would have been drowned there was nothing to do but wait three endless days and then the water fell as suddenly as it had risen hori made his way back to his broken camp everything had been swept away there was no sign anywhere of the sheep flung to their death they must have been on that awful night listen surely that was a sheep bleating around the hillock hori rode toward the sound that grew ever louder his heart pounded at his throat a dog's bark sounded clearly and then the wonder there on a bachelor hill spread out over the whole rounding top of it surged a mass of woolly fleece and from side to side of it ran a weary half-starved black dog hori was off his horse in a twinkling and darky was in his arms panting crying mumbling his ears and fingers for very gladness and relief from his long watch darky had been with hori for two years when belcher put the stout maori and another shepherd in charge of a herd that was to be taken to mount cook district this was not a difficult track except for the fact that they must pass a glacier-fed river whose waters were cold so cold 
that animals passing through it shivered for a whole day after there were no bridges no way across for the sheep and the horses but to swim the men and dogs went over on a rickety platform-like machine drawn through the air on a wire rope thirty feet above the rushing torrent it was a crazy affair at the best carrying in a most fearsome way and the landing was dangerous and rocky as they neared the farther side the dogs scrambled to be first on the ground there was a slip a shudder and darky was pitched from the platform to the rocks beneath a cry the only cry of pain he ever uttered and darky rolled to the edge of the water and disappeared only for a minute then hori saw him rise to the surface not swimming but beating the water with his paws as if he were hurt with a leap hori landed on the rocks on all fours scrambling to his feet he raced along downstream to the water's edge lying down he stretched out the arm just as the dog came floating past darky saw his master and gave one pleading glance for help and then hori reached him reached him by one ear and drew him in darky could not help himself hori lifted him out of the water and looked him over his right hind leg was broken and there was something the matter with his hip shoot him said the other shepherd he's no good any more for a moment hori did not answer he rose to his feet with darky in his arms i get him home he said you take the sheep easy way now you'll be fired belcher won't stand for it if you desert i get him home was hori's only answer as he mounted Murhali brothers who had landed safely in front of the flock hori knew a short cut dangerous but shorter by twelve miles on this trail he started darky lay in his arms suffering silently but trusting his master to do what was best and Murhali brothers too did his best glad of the exercise that warmed his frozen blood over to suck and spaniard they bounded down the stony bed of a trickling stream where the pebbles rolled and the horse stumbled and risked his knees now he tore past echoing rock which sent back the sound of galloping in mysterious sighs now through scrub now through the open now down to a river which hori knew to be the cruel waitaki with its wicked waters and treacherous hidden quicksands carefully they picked their way here once mulhali brothers put a foot forward and went down down only by a violent jerk back upon the reins did hori save his horse from the inevitable death that would have followed another step safe on the other side at last now there was a dizzy climb up the steep bank then a trail to be followed along the edge of a black chasm a stone rolled under the horse's foot and well it was only one of those many chances that saved them from falling three hundred feet over the cliff now there was a climb down a hillside over a mass of shale and rubbish left by the rains a little farther on and there before them lay weka flat and home no time to lose now darky who had lain unconscious through the last hour opened his piteous eyes as hori bent over him nursing his hurts the pain was fearful but the plucky fellow never winced he knew hori loved him 
and that the pain of setting and binding the splintered bones was help then came the knitting of the bones convalescence and recovery no not that for never again would poor darky do more than crawl to the door and lie basking in the sun there was some internal hurt that hoary with all his gentle nursing could not reach back to belcher's at last went hoary carrying the useless darky perhaps belcher would discharge him for deserting his duty to the flock there is no doubt that belcher would have sent him to the right about had it not been that at this time there was a shortage of hands at the rugged hills station as it was he got off with a tongue lashing and was given a position at the station itself nothing was said about darky's present condition and belcher did not know until well it was winning time when lambs were separated from their mothers and all sheep herders know how difficult it is to manage the flock of ignorant homesick babies the air was full of their lamentations and one stronger minded than the usual run of lambs broke for home and mother this should have been darky's cue for action and darky tried the other lambs started to follow the belligerent one and darky hobbled to his feet went a little way then looked up at hoary sadly no use darky would never run any more lambs scattered far and wide and all the morning's work was to be done over and belcher saw that was the worst of it saw in spite of the fact that hoary tried to shield the dog what's the matter with that cur hoary looked down darky sicky dog he said at last well we aren't keeping sick dogs at this station if they can't drive sheep they go hear that he looked sharply at the big maori so that's what you were up to when you deserted the flock nursing a sick dog bah he kicked at darky but hoary stood between and got the blow see here no hand of mine can fool away his time like that i'll dispose of that nuisance you take him over to the boundary i'll teach him to work for a nigger when he wouldn't work for me leave him there and then come back and attend to your business or get out do you hear the thieving mongrel must go take him at once and if i catch him here again a boundary dog's life is the life of a prisoner he is simply chained on the outskirts of the range to scare away intruders no good dog is ever given the position it is the useless the unteachable the good-for-nothing dogs who are reduced to this so at castle bluffs hoary chained darky and went back to his work with a heavy heart every day when his other work was done hoary rode over on muhalle brothers seven miles fed and watered darky fondled him for a short half hour and then rode back to the station all day long darky barked and howled his misery to the yellow tussocks serving his purpose through his very sorrow at nightfall he sat with his eyes strained over the distance out of which hoary would presently appear fed and comforted he would pull through the night to begin another lonely day one afternoon it was christmas eve and hot stifling weather on the south island of new zealand darky was wakened from a nap by a friendly shout he jumped to his feet 
and saw rising toward him one of the herders from belchers the man stopped dismounted and bent over the dog darky old boy you're having a tough time of it out here alone aren't you i've a mind yes i'll do it belcher is off to southland on a spree and he'll never know how would you like to spend christmas with hori darky barked with joy at hori's name here goes come on there'll be no harm done the boundary will be all there when we bring you back the chain was loosened and with darky in his arms the herder leaped to his saddle and was off for the station there he delivered the dog to the surprised maori ah but that was a happy christmas eve for the two darky snuggled close to hori as he sat in the compound at night they slept in the same bed morning came and darky hobbled close to hori's heels his eyes lighting up at every word from his master belcher would not be back before the next day and at nightfall hori would ride back and leave darky at his post high noon and rest time for the man darky lay asleep at hori's feet in the happy christmas sunshine the silence of the wide new zealand country lay around them Horace's glance at the black friend at his feet was soft and tender. A sound of horses' hoofs, a slamming gait, and a stream of ugly oaths broke upon the stillness. Darky opened his eyes with a low growl. Horry jumped to his feet. Yes, the unexpected had happened. There sat Belcher on his foam flecked horse he was as they say in that country a bit on he had a grievance the sun and draught not to mention whisky had upset him he had come home sooner than was anticipated and was primed for trouble his eyes lighted on darky and hoary ha you nigger so that's the way you use my time when I'm gone. What's that dog doing here? Hori looked foolish, but could not reply. Ha! Stand out of the way if you don't want to be shot. Belcher leveled his pistol full at the dog's head, and Hori, instead of jumping to one side, seized Darky and held him between his knees. Don't shoot him! Please, massa, I'll count three. One, two, are you going to drop him? Three, a good shot. Belcher's intoxication did not hinder his markmanship. Straight between Horry's hands, he aimed and fired. Darky was led on the grass. Never more would he be a boundary dog, a glaze stole over his eyes they would never light again at the sound of hori's voice hori stood dazed looking at belcher so white he would never have known him to be a full-blooded maori come up to the house for your check as soon as you like the black man stooped and lifted the body of the black dog in his arms Hori make you Christmas gift of money. Without another word, he turned and left Rugged Hills Station forever. End of section 5、section、six of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives. Section 6 Byron, a Dog of Scotland. 
a short sharp bark a long drawn howl of misery and then silence dr ross turned aside into the little coppice that bordered the path along his meadow for he was returning cross lots from a professional visit in the nearby village from the depths of the underbrush the sounds were repeated something must be in trouble said the good doctor as he hurried a little faster bide a bit there he plunged in among the matted vines and shrubs to the spot whence came the cries and stopped suddenly when a big collie appeared in the depths of the tangle byron is it you byron what are you doing here poaching on my preserves as i live i didn't think it of you why what's the matter poor old chap i take that back someone else is the poacher and he's caught you in his trap byron whimpered big fine sheepdog that he was bred to and doing a man's work here he was crying like a baby for sheer pain and his paw the poor paw of him with which he had so unwittingly stepped into the poacher's trap dr ross released it from the cruel teeth that had snapped on it and held it bleeding and broken boned in his hand while he examined it that's a bad paw but we can mend it don't you know byron that even innocent squirrel chasing is wrong when we should be tending our flock byron could not tell the doctor that he too had been cutting cross lots to catch up with his master james burnett who had gone on a hurried errand leaving his sheep in the byre but he looked his innocence and grief at dr ross's misjudgment of him there now byron i didn't mean to hurt your feelings you're a good dog and the best of you must have a failing or two or you would be all angels and not dogs there's my kerchief tied to stop the bleeding can you limp along a bit to my office you're too big to carry we'll soon put you to rights dr ross led the way out of the coppice across the meadow and into his own garden thence to the little latticed doorway that opened into his private office byron hobbled dolefully after him as he opened the door the doctor beheld james burnett his uncle's head shepherd and byron's master waiting for him in the cheery little office his hands spread before the blaze that danced on the hearth for it was autumn and chilly good morning what brings you here james i came doctor to get a bit of physic for the lassie she's ailing byron he looked sharply at the dog what's wrong with you byron came shambling in on three legs and sat before his master holding up his bandaged paw as his answer what have you done with yourself man that you are seeking the doctor caught his foot in a trap james evidently there are poachers about i bade him bide at home this morning but he's always wanting to be with me and i'm thinking he came after me by the burn and over your meadow byron do you not know the wrong of disobedience it was the prompting of affection james i i know and there is no better dog with the sheep in all scotland well he must take his punishment with the rest of them that gang their ain gate wait till i dress the paw james and he can go back with you unless maggie is very ill it's not so serious doctor just a bit pain in the stomach i'll bide with swift skilled fingers dr ross cleaned byron's paw set the bone and bound it in splints the dog meanwhile uttering no complaint gritting his teeth manfully to the pain confident in the doctor's skill and sure that what was happening was for the best he won't be much use to you on the moors for a couple of weeks james but he's worth coddling and he'll come out all right he took the dressing like a stoic he can abide with elsie and wee maggie till he has four legs to run with you're a good friend to him and to us all he hesitated i have a bit cough myself doctor that's stickin by me could you give me a dose for that 
indeed i can here you are coddle yourself a bit james and wrap up warmly a cough like that is a bad thing to start with in a winter season the shepherd started home with his dog on three legs at his side for two or three days james came with byron for the dressing of the paw after that byron came alone and a great friendship sprang out of the big heart of the doctor and the gratitude of the dog in as short a time as possible with good blood a fine constitution and proper care byron's paw was as good as the best but even after he had gone back to his work with the flock he made visits to the doctor coming after the day's work was over and he was released from duty as for james burnett when the first blasts of winter struck the rolling hills around moffatdale his cough developed into something worse and before michaelmas came vices in its worst form had left elsie without a husband and maggie and willie without a father as dr ross sat by the sick man in his last hours james opened his eyes will you bend a bit nigher doctor the doctor leaned above the bed and his strong warm grip closed on james's wasted hand you have been very good to me and mine doctor and i would like to give byron to you he loves you now almost more than any other will you call him here byron lay on the doorstone where he was wooing the thin rays of wintry sunshine at the doctor's call he entered the sick room with all the solemnity of the occasion glooming in his eyes james laid his hand on the dog's furry cheek byron you must always bide with dr ross i'm going away and i cannot come back to you elsie woman a cough interrupted him then a violent spasm of choking a sudden gush of blood from the lungs then there was no sound but elsie's tearless sobs and the childish weeping of little maggie who did not understand but cried because her mother did after the funeral byron went home with dr ross for many days he was like a lost child and would run off to his old flock whenever a fit of homesickness seized him but there was a new shepherd there and a new dog and he soon grew to understand that his old master was gone and that he was to abide with the doctor as james had willed it was a much more comfortable life if not quite so much to byron's liking he would follow dr ross on his rounds waiting quietly by the horse during calls the neighbors soon grew to know that a sight of byron heralded the approach of dr ross he chose the stable at night for his sleeping quarters for he was not accustomed to luxury and his own warm coat had always been shelter enough even in the wild weather on the moors as the months went on he grew quite happy and contented if the old life among the heather called to him now and then with too sweet insistence he would disappear perhaps for a day but sunset found him always back at the latticed door of dr ross's office evenings he would spend with his head between his paws gazing at the study fire wrapping the floor with his tail when the back log fell or when dr ross stirred up the embers on a july day of the year after james's death there was a fair in progress at moffat and the doctor walked over to see the merrymaking byron capering and delighted ran hither and thither filled with the joy of the day once he digressed like the gentleman he was to rescue the underdog in an unequal fight then he was off again as if rescuing the oppressed were an everyday matter to him the fair itself was like all fairs after the races and the games were over the doctor did not remain longer than to greet a few friends he was past the days of giddy-go-rounds and sweetmeats but while he gained nothing in particular at the fair he did lose something 
the key to his laboratory he discovered the loss on his return in vain he tried his other keys in the lock nothing would fit then he bethought himself byron he said to the dog who waited to follow him in byron i have lost my key can you find it a key like this one byron he showed him one similar to the key lost byron with an expectant quiver smelled the key then with a look of keen intelligence at his master he trotted off by the road they had taken to the fair nose to the trail he went arriving at the fairgrounds he did what a human detective might have done he seemed in his mind to divide the whole field into squares the crowd had thinned out so that he was not interrupted but there were many interested spectators square by square he took the ground running in circles from the outside always closing in on the center over and over he did this at last those interested enough to watch him at his maneuvers saw him as he was working near the grandstand pick up something in his mouth after which there was no more hunting he turned tail and left the fairgrounds running swiftly all the way back to moffatdale three hours after he had been sent on his quest he reappeared at dr ross's home he carried in his mouth the lost key there came a winter a bitter time it was when the snows came early and lay deep and long on hill and valley byron's old flock had been grazing on the outlying hills of the district and when the first flakes fell out of the leaden sky they were far from home then all at once the temperature dropped amazingly and an icy norther swooped down upon them the air was filled with a mass of fine stinging flakelets that bit in even through homespun and coats of wool blinding the eyes of sheep dog and man through the smother and the howling fury the shepherd of moffatdale and his dog worked like heroes while there was yet a chance for life across the moor the swirling snow devils danced their spiral reels whirling up and up to fall at last in ever deepening drifts the sheep bleating with fear and the awful cold suffered themselves to be gathered from ridge and gully and so clustered running and stumbling and ever running to keep from freezing they were painfully driven homeward as the dusk fell hardly making the world darker than had the storm in at the byre gates and out of the fangs of the gale swept the huddle of sheep dog and master safe safe yes but not all james burnett's successor counted opened his tired eyes and counted again the number was sixty-five short where in that inferno that shrieked and clamored outside were the sixty-five lost for sure the shepherd started from sheer force of his duty toward the door but returned as the blast nearly knocked him over thankful that at least a goodly number were safe it meant death to try to find the others even had he not already been exhausted he sat dejectedly with his head in his despairing hands while the storm beat vainly upon the byre morning and a white world walls and hedges there were none bramble wild rose and prickly whin bushes gone where were once black tarns lay white floors the dimpling cup-like little valleys were lost the only colors were the gold of the clearing sky the blue of the smoke threads that stole heavenward from the buried cottages and here and there along the burn a bit of slow moving brown that had had the courage to break through the walls of its white prison three shepherds good and true with their dogs started out in the early light to find the missing sheep three shepherds 
hunted through a weary day and dragged themselves home at night not having seen the tales even of the lost they sat in weary despair over their supper of steaming porridge in the kitchen at moffatdale and then and only then did one of them say byron he'd be the lad to find them there's ain sheep and he kens all the crannies in the hills thus it was that early the next morning the crestfallen shepherd of moffatdale knocked at dr ross's door and told the tale of the disaster byron called his master byron came eagerly there was a new vibration in dr ross's voice it awakened old thrills that had lain sleeping through the comfortable years he looked at the shepherd and in his heavy homespun he smelled the old familiar odor of flock and byre byron said the doctor there are sixty-five sheep missing find them sixty-five sheep he repeated this slowly and clearly the dog hung on his words for an instant then lifting his head to the wind as if he knew already what humans could not he gave a quick short bark and was gone alone leaping plunging smothering in the drifts then up and off again he worked his way across the meadow over the sleeping burn the hill beyond and a wind-swept upland then he bounded over the ridge and was out of sight and the sheep oh he found them of a surety never doubt that in a dry tarn hole he found them where they had sought shelter from the storm there the snow had swirled and settled over them in a great drift until they were huddled safe and snug in a room of snow hollowed out by the warmth of their bodies and covered with a roof of white flakes three feet thick no eskimo was ever safer in his steaming igloo than the little band of strays but it was close quarters and two days without food had destroyed any sense of thankfulness they might have had at the outset into the little valley came byron sniffing and plunging and shaking the snow from his dark coat and here there came to him the sheep smell who should know it better byron barked and down at the bottom of the clue there sounded an answering bah down the rocks he felt his way going cautiously as he neared the hole lest he should be buried in the drift along a granite seam where the scent came strongest he began to dig with his paws the snow flew as he tunneled in faster and faster he dug until at last he broke through into the strange shelter they were all there and there were many of them who had known byron of old they obeyed his voice and started for the tunneled opening with their old herder at their heels out they went and over moor and fen and crag they traveled the white world at byron's bidding it was eight of the morning when he started at three of the afternoon the shepherd of moffatdale saw the last remnant of his flock silhouetted on a nearby hill crest into the byre they came sixty-five not one missing with a pause at the door of the cottage where elsie still lived a bark of greeting to her and the lad and the lassie and a look of piteous pleading for the old master who was away he was off once more back to dr ross his duty done once again in that bleak winter came a storm that raged like a sea on a rock-bound coast the wind blowing sixty miles an hour drove the snow in clouds of fine dust that settled at last from sheer weight into huge drifts it was a storm overtopping any storm known for years through it at nightfall dr ross drove his gasping horse for he had been caught while on his rounds under the buggy plodded byron weary too with the long battle 
giving the reins to the stable boy the doctor entered the cozy fire-lit hall and was met by his housekeeper it's a pity now doctor to tell you this but elsie burnett is much worse and they do say it may be scarlet fever willie has come over through the storm and he's very anxious you'll find him waiting in the kitchen dr ross looked regretfully at the leaping fire and through the doorway of the dining room where he caught a vision of white linen and shining silver then he braced himself to the task that a country doctor must so often meet i had better go i might send medicines but it's unsafe to let willie go back alone and elsie may need my personal attention i'll just take a bite and some hot tea byron are you good for another journey i'll need you to shepherd me if i get lost will you go to james burnett's cottage with willie and me would he he needed no further asking he rose from the hearth where his long wet hair was already wreathed with steam shook himself and stood with uplifted head ready the doctor made a hurried meal eating it in morsels even while he made his preparations for departure i'll tie the medicines to you byron if i fail to make it you may be able to win through to the cottage with willie you are both young two miles whew, and my horse is exhausted we must fetch it on foot by the short cut bundled to the eyes in coats and mufflers topped with a shepherd's plaid dr ross stepped into the kitchen to find that willie in his anxiety had gone on ahead then he turned with byron and went out into the night and storm there was no path the snow in ever moving masses was absolutely trackless even their own footprints as they stepped out of them disappeared as if by magic there was nothing to be seen only a gray writhing vortex with the doctor's lantern for its center letting the dog lead the way he went on with a prayer to the god of battles for strength elsie burnett's cottage lay at the head of a long gulch that ran between two hills in fine weather one might climb with safety but on a night like this there was much to fear at the base of the hill dr ross faced the real danger that rose before him down through the gulch the gale came whistling a death song it was as if the four winds of heaven had poured into that steep and narrow pass up and down the rocky sides of it they shrieked and hammered clutching and throttling each other dr ross felt for the rocky wall at his left and clinging to any stray bush or escarpment he stumbled along with his bobbing lantern once he staggered and fell and the lantern immersed in the snow went out dragging himself to an angle in the rocks where he could relight it he looked around fearful that byron would be out of sight no there he stood looming up big and black against the weird gray ghosts of the gulch waiting the doctor's good pleasure on they went two moving shadows a light and a ring of soft gold down the ravine thundered the tempest and up they moved against it now they reached the second height and the beginning of a path on the edge of the steepest place where they must round the hill here the wind hurled the doctor back and he was obliged to move slowly and between the gusts clinging desperately to the rock and edging along as he dared fortunate it was that the wind blew from the chasm thus pinning him as it were to the ledge instead of blowing him away suddenly as he was rounding the bend byron stopped ears erect listening quivering as if something out there in the void had uttered a warning the doctor listened but the booming of the great guns of the tempest drowned every other noise 
Byron calmed down again and proceeded slowly, still looking and listening. He showed no excitement now, but a steady self-possession. Now he stopped a second time, looked over the edge of the clue, then back at Dr. Ross as if he were solving a problem. Then, with a quick step, he turned back to his master and pressed against him gently, as if he were a sheep to be herded to safety. As plainly as words his gestures said, Go back, master, danger ahead. Perforce the doctor began retracing his steps, obeying the superior instincts of the animal. Then, remembering his errand of mercy, he turned once more to his task. We've got to reach the cottage, Byron. Elsie may die. For answer, Byron gave a low growl, then a more savage one, as if he intended positively to dispute the passage. All right, Byron, lead the way. I'll follow. You know your business. Herd me, drive me, lead me. I'm yours to command. Seeing the doctor's docility, Byron started back around the curve. Into a side path he led the way, and up a longer but less dangerous track. So, by a detour, they came safely at last to the cottage. Dropping his spent body into a chair, the doctor sat for a moment until his breath came back and his heart began to beat to an easier measure. Then he looked up and before speaking took in the situation. Little Maggie was alone with her mother. Willie had not returned. Somewhere out in that storm he was lost struggling, perhaps dying, or dead. Moments were precious now, and the mother in her critical state must not be alarmed. Swiftly the doctor untied the package of medicine from Byron's neck, and ministered with his own hands and the little lassie's help to Elsie's immediate wants. The woman groaned, opened her eyes, looked around the room, and then rested her fever-stricken eyes on Dr. Ross. Where's Willie? Did not he come with you? He's all right, Elsie. He'll follow later. I came on ahead. There now, Maggie, lass. Listen carefully and remember, this is to be given to your mother every hour, and this, as I have written on the bottle, when the fever goes down. Now, Mrs. Burnett, You'll be feeling fine in the morning, and I must get back. I may keep Willie all night if the storm gets worse. Now, good night and a good sleep. Good night, and God be with you. God be with you. The words drifted out into the tempest as the doctor stepped over the cottage threshold and shut the door on the warmth and light. He had need of that prayer. Stooping, he spoke in the ear of the dog who had followed him. Lo, he whispered, so that the words should not reach anxious ears in the cottage. Byron, Willie's in the gulch. We must find him. The dog gave a little whine, as if to say, I understand, and was off so rapidly that Dr. Ross had difficulty in keeping sight of him. Not by the road they had come did Byron travel. Instead, he plunged into a one-time path that led directly down into the gulch. This was old ground to him, and once his home, and Willie was one of his old family. He knew every inch of the place, and he knew things, too, that Dr. Ross did not know. Down he went, here in the lower part of the gulch the wind did not reach with such fury and a more rapid progress was possible all at once byron stopped dead in his tracks and as the doctor caught up with him he began pawing at the snow looking up along the face of the sheer rock to which he clung dr ross recognized above him 
the path around the bend back from which byron had herded him just a glimpse he had and then the smoke-like rolling of the snow eddies closed around him again hiding all that was not within the golden ring around the lantern byron was digging now digging with all his remaining strength he scraped frantically at the snow as if something was hidden there in a half stupor caused by the cold and exhaustion the doctor watched was that a bit of homespun that dark fragment in the snow that byron's work had disclosed down went the doctor on his knees and he too worked the snow flew faster yes it was willie willie who had fallen over the rock just in the place from which byron had warned the doctor all weariness was gone now man and dog worked for the life of the boy for he was not dead the snow beneath had softened the shock of his drop and the snow that fell over him had kept him from freezing he had been stunned however and had he been left to himself he must have perished but byron had found him and now dr ross with the lad in his arms made his last terrific struggle with the storm then in the glow of elsie's hearth fire willie's eyes opened and his lips formed the words where am i elsie was sleeping so soundly that she never knew until the next morning of the night's adventure but she tells it proudly now and in her eyes grows the light of adoration as she speaks of the good doctor and that shaggy embodiment of the stuff that makes heroes byron of moffatdale end of section six recording by sue anderson section seven of dog heroes of many lands this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. dog heroes of many lands by sarah noble ives bum a brooklyn dog got any references no die look like havin references not any to speak of i'll admit the owner of the Bergen street stables looked over the derelict specimen of humanity with amused contempt the long lanky form had the air of not having been well constructed in the first place a suit of clothes once dark blue now faded to an indescribable greenish brown ill covered him so shrunken was the poor shoddy of its material frayed edges and unmended holes betokened the lack of personal care and the lack of any one to care for him the coat collar turned up and buttoned to the throat hid what the worn sleeves betrayed by their skimped length that there was need of the garment to which one attaches collars and cuffs dried mud caked his boots between the holes and decked the man's trousers thinning out to splashes on the coat tails he was hollow-cheeked and hollow-eyed his whole being was a threnody of hard luck it was almost a sacrilege to call him a man but god made him so he passed for one where did you work last on the pennsylvania road hmm president i suppose or maybe only a conductor in a palace car quit your kiddin i was diggin on the road bed with the dagos and you got fired what if i did you get fired for nothin nowadays i wasn't a union man and they found i had another man's ticket yes yes i know there isn't much humanity in any kind of corporation nowadays that's nothing being fired anybody's liable to lose his place but there's something else done time haven't you what business is that of yours the young man gave the elder a sharp sidelong glance oh nothing nothing i should say it was about two years ago judging from the condition of your clothes that's the regular cut they give them when they let them out i've seen others and you haven't got all of the lock step out of your system yet i saw you as you turned in 
quite a sherlock holmes i am now see here i'd rather like to know what you did it wasn't murder or you wouldn't be out with that suit on but while there are some things a man can live down there are others that if he does once he does again and worse what was it you went up for burglary if you gotta know when a feller's hard up and he can't find nothing to do he's gotta do what he can i suppose it's no use now to ask you for a job the man coughed and turned away hmm the stable owner rubbed his hand carefully over his beard terminating with a roll of the fingers toward the tip how old are you twenty-three hmm well maybe it isn't in the grain yet a man that steals for a business is hard to cure but if it's a case of being hard up maybe there's a chance now see here boy mr devon straightened up and looked directly into the young fellow's eyes it's plain to see that you haven't had much of the upper crust or the filling maybe it's your own fault and maybe it isn't but you're young and perhaps if you can get off your uppers you'll make good yet i'm going to give you a chance not a big one but a chance if you can dig on a railroad bed you can clean out stables i need a stable boy but mind you no drink and no smoking cut those out i can't have my horses neglected nor my stables set on fire as for stealing try the straight thing and see how it works what's your name gallagher thomas gallagher say mr devon you're white you are and you won't be sorry forget it said devon here's a quarter run and get yourself a cup of coffee and a sandwich before you begin got a place to stay no we'll sleep in the stables if you like i have to keep someone here and the other men all have families wait got any money just this here quarter well i'll give you part of your week's wages in advance to tide you over curran here will show you what to do gruff generous mr devon turned back to his book balancing in the little coop of an office and gallagher with a tear trembling on his eyelid he was not too far from boyhood as to be above human emotion went about his new duties he trusted me i'll show him and gallagher did show him never had mark devon so little cause for complaint in his understable hand he cleaned the stalls he fetched and carried and even when the other men imposed on him he did not resent it i'll make good he said november was passing by and thanksgiving was near already gallagher had made a rough attempt at mending up the old suit for work with his scanty savings he had he had acquired a sweater and a decent pair of trousers and aspired with his next week's surplus to a shirt he was planning even still further grandeur by new year's i guess i'll be able to get me a good warm coat this sweater'll have to do till then lucky i don't have to pay room rent he glanced down the street after curran who had just driven out with a dray looks like snow in them clouds oh well snow's nothing when you've got a job and a place to sleep kinder cozy in this here stable too snow it did the great storm of november twenty five is not yet forgotten a real blizzard it was with howling wind snow flying drifts piling traffic stopped the next morning devon could not get over from his home on myrtle avenue one of the stablemen who lived near curran it was floundered in breathless and spent with his struggle some storm he said to gallagher you're lucky to be here without coming he removed his coat and cap and shook off the snow that hung wet and thick to the rough wool there won't be any business this day devon'll play a losing game no team could haul anything half a block what you going out you're a fool to try got to get my breakfast now you're here said gallagher shoo i'd give you part of my lunch if i had enough to last you'll have to get something i suppose and enough to last all day so you won't have to go out again there isn't a restaurant open though you'll have to go about three blocks there's a little soup factory over on atlantic avenue that'll be boiling the pot i guess the folks live there that's the only place you can be sure of gallagher buttoned up his sweater to the last notch and swung out letting the wind help him he covered the three blocks despite the difficulties of travel with a hot breakfast to hearten him he started back but found that making progress against the gale was quite another thing pulling down his cap to cover his ears and with his bundle of lunch under his arm he started but even while he had been sitting in the little eating-house new drifts had whirled in on the side street eddies 
and the way he had come was choked and impassable i'll try it on the next cross street he said to himself there is a warehouse there with a covered walk battling pushing stumbling falling rising again and struggling on he fought his way along just one more block and he would be back in the stables heavens what a blast that was gallagher was turning the corner that led back to bergen street when the wind rushing down between the buildings caught him knocked the breath out of him and plastered him flat against a brick wall jiminy just saved my cap that time this beats anything he pried himself loose from the wall only to be hurled into a snowbank blinded dizzy and breathing in dry gasps he righted himself what's that out of the other side of the drift came a wail a pitiful sobbing whimper some poor cur lost in it said gallagher well i got to save myself again the cry heartbreaking and almost human in its pathos that's trouble no mistake guess i'll have to turn life-saver hi there coming if i can get to you for an answer a yelp faint but imploring coming coming there gallagher waited behind the drift for a lull and then made a plunge around to the other side gritting his teeth he burrowed in toward the place of of wailing and pulled out the whaler a small dog with nothing to recommend him but the agony in his eyes there you poor little feller i'll save you stop crying now you and me is the same breed i guess there he stuffed the animal under his sweater bent his head to the wind and staggered on now he was down and he and his burden were floundering helplessly almost hopelessly now he was up again his breath came quick and hard and his lungs felt as though their power was burning to the last flicker things began to go black then with a final lurch and still holding the dog he fell heavily against the stable door curran opened it and pulled him in picked him up and sat him on an overturned half bushel measure against the wall and while the boy slowly recovered his breath the man took a good look at the specimen of canine infirmity that gallagher had dropped on the floor where'd you get it snowdrift said gallagher when he could speak what do you call it dog i reckon pretty bum specimen worth saving do you think i had to it yelped yes i suppose so just as we preserve idiots and crazy folks because we can't kill em what'll you do with him keep him think devon'll let me i don't know he doesn't look useful and you can't call him an ornament certainly he was not an ornament of no of no race at all although with an imagination you might guess that some ancestor at some time had been a fox terrier he was or had been at birth white with black spots on his head and sides he was so thin that every bone showed so empty that his ribs almost knocked together his surface displayed almost every species of eruption and evidence of assault and battery that could be collected together in so small an area he had them all from the mange to a broken tooth the latter evidently the result of an application of boot well now you've got the pretty little thing what's your next move first thing i'll thaw him out gallagher dropped on his knees beside the dog and began rubbing the cold stiffened limbs here's a horse blanket to lay him on said curran who began to awake to an unusual good samaritan feeling say as soon as you've got him so as he can wiggle i've got some coffee in my tin and i can heat a bit on the office stove you keep rubbing curran bustled off and in a minute he was back here you hold his jaws open and i'll pour it down the dog opened his eyes as the warm liquid went down his throat that'll surprise his interior i'm thinking there see he's coming too what do you think of that the dog struggled and tried weakly to get on his emaciated legs cowering at the same time as if he expected a blow see that now said gallagher he's been kicked around so much that he doesn't recognize friends when he meets up with them he's the limit for looks here give him another nip of that er beverage do you think devon would object if i took him into the office where it's warm devon ain't here and he won't be while this storm lasts so he won't know better thaw him out a bit more first though too hot for a frozen dog in there then after a bit i'll give him a piece of cold mutton i got with my lunch i brought something too from the restaurant said gallagher i guess we can manage to fill him up and keep him well you take the risks yourself he's your dog what are you going to call him a bum-looking beast like that ought to be proud of any old name i'll just call him that said gallagher bum 
he's a bum-looking dog and i'm bum myself here you bum you just lay still inside this blanket i'm going to get the frost by out in you and some grub into you and i'd advise first thing that you give him a bath and get the mange off him i've got some soap to do the trick i'll bring in a pail of water and heat it on the office stove and we'll roll him up in the blanket till he dries off a bath'll be the most surprising thing yet likely the first he ever had the dog took the rough but kindly treatment in a dazed fashion not understanding it in the least but he did come around under it all and in a vague way began to realize that no harm was intended him there being no business that day the two men after their regular work of tending the horses spent their spare hours putting heart into this newcomer he was fed scrubbed rubbed down and dried while the storm howled in baffled fury outside by nightfall he was on his legs following timidly at gallagher's heels cringing when spoken to but sneaking up in spite of his fear for the kind touch of this new and extraordinary master he even managed to coax a bit of wag into that broken tail of his which never before had had any occasion for such demonstration that night after all the stable work was done and curran had gone home to his family around the block gallagher took bum with him to the little cubby in the hayloft and together they lay in mutual warmth and happiness the derelict man with the hollow chest and the derelict dog with a grateful heart and the storm hissed and shrieked under the eaves and around the window casement in vain now whatever mr devon thought when he came in bright and early the next morning he did not disclose he only said that as curran had where'd you get that in a drift said gallagher then with a new note in his voice he asked can i keep him hmm he's not a beauty and he won't bring trade just now he isn't much of an advertisement for the business oh yes keep him if you want to but fatten him up as soon as you can so bum became an attache of the Bergen street stables beautiful he could never be and never did he lose that habit of cringing when spoken to suddenly but in spite of it his confidence in humankind grew apace and his devotion to gallagher was almost abject at his heels he followed from early morn till dewy eve gallagher picked a restaurant where dogs were favored and many a bone came his way from the slipshod waiter whatever gallagher could afford for himself he shared with bum not minding that his purchase of warmer clothing had to be put off a little farther december was a mild month that year and gallagher made up for the chilliness of his exterior by the warmth about his heart he began to whistle about his chores though now and then he would be interrupted by a fit of coughing the dog grew in plumpness if not in grace but gallagher himself did not christmas eve in a cold clear sunset with a rising wind the people doing their last bits of shopping drew their furs closer as they stepped out into the street and joined the gay hurrying throng mr devon about eight of the clock came into the stables for a last look he glanced at the thermometer that hung outside and saw that it registered ten below zero and was still falling curran and the other men had gone home and he stopped to glance over his accounts and to smile at the balance to his credit he smiled again as he looked at an armful of bundles that were to go home with him and be added to the piles under the bulging stockings yes and for the wonderful christmas tree waiting in the darkened room around whose doors five merry children had been tiptoeing all day christmas was a great institution for the kids and he and mother too were as excited as the rest when jenny or rob laid on their altars some gift of their own contriving devon had been prospered this year yes he looked into the glow of the little office stove already the red was dying out and a chill crept through the office walls the sound of a hollow cough came from the stables without gallagher gallagher came in with bum at his heels it is cold to-night be sure to give the horses good thick beds and blanket them well will you be all right yourself yes sir i've plenty of bed covers and i can get an extra horse blanket if need be devon looked sharply at the thin face you don't look any too spry bum here is growing to be the handsomer man of the two aren't you well i'm all right said gallagher with a little shrug just a nasty little cough it's nothing next week payday i'll be able see here haven't you got warm underwear 
haven't needed it as i say next week i'll now now i didn't think of that this christmas eve business started me to remember that i haven't paid you very big wages while i was trying you out why yes a fellow's got to live and even bones for bum must cost something see here you come up to my house tomorrow at two o'clock and we'll give you a christmas dinner that'll make your eyeballs jingle and i have some old underwear you can have and i'm going to raise your wages you've done mighty well good night and a merry christmas merry christmas sir mr devon you've been white all through to me and i'm not forgetting it all right all right you've proved my theory a man needn't always stay in the gutter because he fell in once or because he was born there either i take it you've never had much of a chance i was born on the east side sir in new york i guess i've been pretty tough devon pressed the lad's hand and was gone out into the cold street whose pavement rang like ice under steel runners i haven't done my whole duty by that boy he said to himself he's got no one to look after him and he needs mothering mary loved to do it god bless her the streets rang with happy laughter how bright the little shops were Devon swung aboard the cross-town car for Myrtle Avenue, and his mind went back to his armful of bundles and the cheery apartment where his wife and children waited for him. After Devon had gone, Gallagher opened his palm and stood staring at a crisp five-dollar bill. Devon certainly was good. The lad, he was only that, had never known anything like this before. And tomorrow there was to be a great dinner. And he was invited. He put the bill carefully away in an old wallet and locked the stable door. Then he saw to it that the horses were well provided for against the growing cold. He shivered as he turned to go upstairs to his loft, and his face was drawn and blue. I'm lucky to have this place to sleep, he said, but it's an awful cold night. Bum, you and I got to snuggle up mighty close or we'll get nipped. The night grew colder and colder. Gallagher tried in vain to coax the sluggish blood in his veins to a faster beat. The frost seemed to burrow into him. Blankets or no blankets. He was grateful for the warmth of bum against his body. But how cold his feet and hands were! Hours went by. The stars burned clear and cold, high above the thin, keen air. But they did not comfort. Sleep did not come to Gallagher. One of the horses grew restless. Likely his blanket's off. I'll go down and see. Gallagher wrapped the covers around bum and, the, and stole down the stairs. Yes, old Bayberry was uncovered. He fastened the blanket more securely and piled straw deep around the horse's legs. Somehow it seemed less cold here than in the chilly loft. What harm if he sat for a bit on that pile of straw with the blanket around his shoulders? For a moment, anyhow. So weary he was with the lack of sleep that to climb the stairway just now seemed impossible. Just a minute and then back to bum. How queer and dry his lungs felt. His cough racked him and he lay back exhausted. He was growing sleepy now. The cold did not seem to bite so fiercely. He wrapped the horse blanket tighter around him and nodded. Sleep was coming. How good it was to sleep and sleep and not feel the cold. The Christmas bells were ringing now. They made a pretty sound. It was Christmas morning, and at two o'clock he was to have a grand dinner. A milk cart went creaking down the street with the driver clapping his arms around him to quicken the circulation. The milk cans clattered and the frost sang on the tires. Bum stirred in his blankets and nosed around for Gallagher, but he was gone. He listened, no sound. He bounded out and down the stair. Yes, there was Gallagher, his Gallagher. Running to him, he poked his nose into the hand that always caressed him. But Gallagher did not move. The dog licked the white, pinched face upturned on the straw. There was a quiver of the eyelids. Good old Bum, murmured Gallagher. And then the eyes closed again. The dawn was coming in through the stable windows. It was not usual for Gallagher to be asleep down here and so fast asleep. It was not all right. Bum must find help. He ran to the office. No one was there. He threw his weight on the street door. It was fastened. Nothing left but to call for help. Bum barked and barked. Then he ran back to Gallagher. He did not stir. Bum returned to the door and sat down and howled long and impotently. No answer. Again he barked and howled his misery and fear. Raging back and forth, he kept up his desperate appeal. The children in the tenement opposite the stables opened their eyes as the gold began to creep up in the east. Merry Christmas, they shouted. Let's look in our stockings. 
My, but it's cold. There's a dog barking somewhere. I bet he's shivering. The elders stirred in their warm beds. I wonder what's the matter with that bothersome dog. He spoiled my nap. Merry Christmas, shouted the children. Sure enough, and the flapjacks must be baked. Mrs. Kittery shivered and began to dress hurriedly. Still the barking and howling were more frantic and insistent. Where is the brute of a dog, said Pat Kittery. Sounds as if he was over in Devon's stables. I believe something's wrong, said Mrs. Kittery from the kitchen, where she was mixing the batter. Why don't you go over and see? That Gallagher stays there nights. Kittery put his nose out the window. Brrr, he said, and put on his overcoat and cap. He went down the stair, crossed the street, and knocked on the stable door. The barking and howling became more frantic than ever. What's the matter in there? Ooh, 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 wailed Bum. The door is locked. I'll have to go around the back and get Curran. Wait here, you. I'm coming back. Curran and Kittery entered the stables, and a little half-crazed dog jumped on them and then darted away toward the corner of the stable. The men did not follow immediately. He ran back, renewed his pleading, and was gone again. And then they followed him. When they reached the, the pile of straw, Bum was crouched on Gallagher's chest, moaning and licking the cold cheek. Curran stopped and placed his ear close to the white face. There's life there yet. We'll bring him around. Bum, you saved your pal. He'd have been gone soon. We ain't been as decent as you, or he'd have been better fitted to be here this cold night. I'll telephone Devon. When Mr. Devon came, Gallagher was just able to smile weakly, despite the pain in his chilled limbs. We are going to fix you up all right, boy, and then for a merry Christmas dinner, and a few other changes. Bum, you go to the party too, and you deserve the best bit of breast on the turkey. Good old Bum, said Gallagher. End of section 7 Recording by April 6090 California, United States of America.